Welcome to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast, addressing all aspects of the digital enterprise, inspiring connection without boundaries and creation without limits. Thank you for tuning in. Here are your hosts, Tom Singer and Craig Brown. Hey there, and welcome back to, or if it's your first time, welcome to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. Thank you so much for coming along on the journey of this show that is designed to be a resource for those who work in and around PLM. The Digital Enterprise Society is a forum for the exchange of ideas surrounding the tools, processes, and practices used across the product lifecycle. To learn more, visit digitalenterprisesociety.org. My name is Tom Singer, and I have the honor to co-host this show with Craig Brown an industry veteran and former PLM leader at General Motors. So Craig, how are things with you today? Things are great. I'm looking forward to today's interview. It's a group of folks I used to work with at General Motors. Nice, and we are sitting here at ConX19, the IPX conference, and we have been doing these interviews live and in person for the last couple of interviews, and it's actually been a lot of fun because we get to look people in the eye. Normally, Craig and I are, are via Zoom, and we, we might have a little video going, but we don't often get to sit here. So, Craig, it's been fun to be uh, in person with you for these last few episodes. Well, thanks, Tom. It's been fun to be with you. We got some more excitement tomorrow, but we'll talk about that later. Yep, you got to keep tuning in to the Digital Enterprise Society because we have had some great interviews and we've got more coming at you. So if this is your first time listening, uh, schedule a little time to binge listen to this podcast. So each week, we try really hard to bring to you interesting interviews and other ideas to help everyone enhance and grow their career. And today, today is going to be one of those shows. We have with us Jean Ruse, and she is the Managing Director of Engineering Services for Allison Transmission. Hey, Jean, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's great to be here with you and Craig. So, Jean, what's your backstory? How did you start off in this world? What was your career trajectory, and, and what do you do today? Well, so my career tra trajectory started with a degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Wyoming, Go Cowboys. Um, and I grew up in Wyoming, so uh, moving to Indianapolis after uh, after finishing school out there to uh, start a career. I was at Delphi Automotive for a while, working as a validation engineer in the ignition uh, product line. And then uh, after that adventure, I, uh, I transitioned to Allison Transmission about 15 years ago and have had a variety of roles at Allison Transmission. I started there in electronic controls hardware, which is basically the... Uh, mechanical engineering of the brain of the transmission, if you will, and uh, was lucky enough to get uh, many opportunities to expand my responsibilities. I had the opportunity to uh, be the lead engineer on the TC10 transmission uh, product development activity, which was Allison's first new product development introduction in a long time, and that was very exciting and really a challenging role. So. Uh, just a great opportunity. And from there, I led product line teams, which are cross-functional um, product management groups. And uh, then I finally, about two and a half years ago, ended up in the role that I'm in now as Managing Director of Engineering Services. And that uh, that role encompasses quite a bit. Basically, we're a support organization for the product development process. Hi, Jean. It, it's great to see a a colleague. Now, you and I actually never worked together, right. but in our different assignments at General Motors and Allison and Delphi, we, we've uh, got a lot of shared experiences. I, too, at one point managed controllers, um, and then um, I was the simulation guy for a while, which I went to Indianapolis a lot to, to work with those similar folks in, um, down there. Um, I'm interested to, to hear from you, um, engineering services, and what do you need from your vantage point? from PLM or from the digital space, this the digital enterprise we talk about? Sure, we have a lot of needs there. I think it won't surprise you to hear that uh, some of our processes are very manual and disconnected. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are a digital company in that we have workflows and things like that, but still to understand the context of information and to track changes is a challenge like I think everybody is facing, um, you know, so, that happens within engineering. It's an enterprise problem, but it's an engineering problem as well. And so across my engineering services organizations, we have to manage the transfer of information from our computer-aided design model-based definition organization mm -hmm. to our prototype hardware procurement organization right. to make sure the right thing gets purchased. 
to manage any changes that happen there, inventory the hardware, mm -hmm. uh, assemble it in the right <laughs> configuration, do the right testing, feed that test data back into the design process for our internal customers so that they can make good decisions about where to take the designs next. And so it really is a mini, mini product life cycle. And so all of the all of the principles of great product lifecycle management that the digital transformation is trying to get after are the same in my world, just at a little bit of a smaller scale. And so those different phases you mentioned, computer-aided design, um, the prototype bomb, if you will, um, and the engineering bomb, are they all in the same system? Are they different tools? No, they're all in the same system. So uh, we are, our current PLM system is an SAP PLM system anchored on the computer-aided design side by uh, NX. Okay, interesting, cool. So, so you also have responsibility for a new test lab that's being developed. Could you expand on that a bit and then come back to how does the digital enterprise or, the, or PLM need to help that? Yeah, sure. So we are very, very excited. We announced earlier this year the uh, construction and opening in 2020 of a facility called the Vehicle Environmental Test Facility, which is directed at taking Allison from a powertrain level integrator, if you mm -hmm. will, more into the vehicle space. We are uh, challenged in the environment to be a better partner for our OEMs, to have strong mm -hmm. relationships with our OEMs, excuse me, and to, uh, to basically be that integrator and the solution that they're looking for. Right. And so this is a key part of our strategy to do that. And, and the facility will be a facility that's capable of testing vehicles all the way from heavy duty pickup trucks all the way into the biggest uh, transit, 60 foot transit buses and off highway vehicles. Uh, we can have the opportunity to simulate road conditions, uh, temperature, em and do emissions testing, simulate altitude. Uh, it, it is going to be one of its kind in the Midwest and in the, Uni in the United States or North America, there's only really one other facility uh, that is accessible that can compare. And so, and so is this a full vehicle chassis or, or is the transmission just ginned up to dynos so that it feels like it's in a real chassis? No, no, no. So we have loads of the powertrain level testing, if you will, today. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're well equipped to handle anything we want to do at the powertrain level. But this is taking it to the vehicle level. We are putting wow. vehicles in this facility. So, so when, you, when you talked about buses, that, that's it's a the much whole bus. bigger chamber than the ones I'm familiar with at General Motors. Yeah, so the, that's interesting. The length of our, we have two, we'll have two chassis cells in okay. the chassis equipped cells in the facility. And uh, they're both 75 feet long. And then in order to... Uh, help us with the throughput associated with soaks. Mm -hmm. We also have a hot soak and a cold soak right. um, area capable of negative 54 F and some really, some cool, cool stuff. Yeah, yeah. We, we, a lot of people don't realize what we both do in, in this, this car and vehicle industry and truck industry. Um, first, the climatic conditions, which I'm sure we're doing the same thing. And we really don't want our competitors to know. Um, <laughs> and further, um, it, it, it's interesting we, we invest this much in test cells um, to, so that we do testing in a controlled environment. I mean, that's one of the objectives, right? But also we were trying to move in more, more and more simulation, and I'm sure you're doing the same. How do you decide how much to do in simulation versus physical test? Or do you have some principles that drive that? <laughs> well, I don't know that I can articulate any buzzword principles for that. Mm -hmm. It is a constant evolution for us in our product development to try to compress product development cycles. Right. And simulation is absolutely a key factor in trying to do that. So, you know, what do we look at there? Well, we look at, are the models correlated? Do we mm -hmm. have the data that can make the simulations valuable? Because, you know, look, that old axiom of, <laughs> you know, good bad data in is bad data oh, out sure, is right. the same thing with models right? right and you unlike testing in the real world you can take um, a bad condition and you can understand it for a bad condition a simulation cer certainly isn't that way because you just get information out and it's mm -hmm. hard to judge whether it was good or bad um, so we're just constantly looking for opportunities to continue to expand and it's all about this pressure for compressed product development cycles and then on top of it, the complexity of systems is just increasing. Right. And so 
taking it back to the vehicle environmental test facility, that's the other thing. I mean, the systems, mm -hmm. as you are well aware, because mm -hmm. I think pass car is even more, mm -hmm. sorry, passenger car is even mm -hmm. more complex than maybe our heavy duty vehicles are, but we're not that far behind you. Um, you know, the systems are just gaining in so much complexity. And so there's real pressure to innovate, be very fast, right. to have uh, integrated complex solutions to manage stuff like better fuel economy right. and better performance, and then do all of that system engineering for no more cost. And, and, and as I recall, Allison has um, hybrid or electric motor parts as well. And, we do. And of course, all of us are pushing to electrification as the battery technology improves. Yes. These test facilities will be able to handle those as well? Absolutely. Well, in the vehicle environmental test facility, certainly you'll have, if you've got an electrified or hybrid vehicle, it'll have mm -hmm. those uh, capabilities already on the vehicle. And that's one of the things that makes uh, the vehicle testing in a laboratory and our ability con to control those things that you have a tough time forcing Mother Nature to do consistently. Um, you know, we will have that capability and the vehicles come equipped with that, but we will also have a battery emulation capability in the mm -hmm. chamber so that we don't have to, uh, you know, in one minute we can be testing a 90% state of charge and the next minute we can be testing a 10% right. state that, of charge. That's cool. Yeah. And so for you kids out there listening to us, really cool jobs in the, the truck and car business. You just got to come talk to them. Well, I'm retired. You can't come talk to me anymore, but you can talk to Gene. They can come talk to me and it is really cool. <laughs> it is really cool. So, so um, the exchange of information in this larger ecosystem, so, so a vehicle customer, which you're providing a transmission to, or, or maybe even, especially fleets of buses, maybe the, the, the county or the city that we're in want information about performance, especially in the electrification side. Um, how, how does um, the digital enterprise help that? Or, or do you have initiatives at Allison to to provide that kind of information to, to other people, whether it be a customer or whether it be the end, end user. Yeah, so our customers, you're exactly right. Our customers are asking for more information about their fleets and their performance and how mm -hmm. the, they can um, have their vehicles delivering more effectively what they're mm -hmm. trying to do. So we've got a couple things going that I don't know that I can really talk about today, okay. but this is a place that we're we're very interested in understanding and presenting our customers with the types of information that are going to help them use our product more effectively because you know and i'll do the whole advertisement here allison's entire goal in the world is to make the world work better mm -hmm. and we that is an important principle for us and one that we've stood behind for a long time and we do that through quality reliability and durability and then a product that delivers mm -hmm. and delivering today is changing mm -hmm. because the customer's expectations are changing. Yeah, and one other thing, and this is for the students, and it's one you can experience. Yes. One of the cool things about our industry is you get to drive what we deal with, or you at least ride in it, right? A lot of other engineering jobs, uh, either because it's a military thing or it's a launch and forget thing, you don't really get to experience it. No. In our business, you get to experience it every day. Your parents get to experience it. Your friends get to experience it. It's actually a lot of fun, right? It is quite a bit of fun, yes. So what else would you like the solution providers, the, the people like SAP and, and NX and so on to do? Is there things that they could help in this journey? Well, I really think that we've got an opportunity here to, you know, we've talked at ConX a lot about kind of standards and mm -hmm. having a um, a structure around what it means to have these very right. good digital transformation systems. And it is a little bit of the wilderness for companies, including Allison Transmission, about trying to figure out what it means to be a digitally transformed organization. And, you know, I buy into the idea of standards at some level. I think there are some complexities there. Mm -hmm. um, but the bottom line is, I think everybody, the meaning of digital transformation and how companies can best and most effectively use that for themselves is individual to the companies to some extent but mm -hmm. there's got to be this foundation upon which to build upon and so you know that engagement with the with the vendors and some openness to i guess both sides engaging in right. a solution i think is a is a very important thing and then i guess the other thing that i would say is this idea of i think scott purdue from config it talked about it today mm -hmm. in you know 
vendors, you know, being willing to say, this is what I'm good at and right. I'm good at this. And this is how you use my stuff versus selling you on the world and not delivering. Well, yeah. And, and he, he and one other uh, gentleman, Rob from, from Aris, they pointed out, you know, we, we big OEMs and, and big tier ones, we are part of the problem because we demand it our way. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need to listen carefully to what they're good at and be satisfied with that. And then we still have some glue, or I call it glue logic that has to be built. Well, yeah, but that doesn't mean we hold up a procurement of a, of a world-class tool just waiting on our local customization. Yeah, well, I mean, you're from GM. We, we come from the same history here. You know how strongly business owners hold on to the way that they've done things. <laughs> and, you know, we have that. Allison is a more than a hundred year old company. Right. We, 65 years ago, more than 65 years ago was the first automatic transmission. We have been successful because of the way that we do things. And you're exactly right. Part of the relationship with the vendors has to be met halfway. Right. Because we've experienced mm -hmm. in multiple situations, having it our way, and being dissatisfied in the end. And that's not all on the vendors. That's right. Thank you for saying that. So we, we need to have this debate in a broader forum. Yeah, <laughs> it's, but, it is on both of us. We both have, meaning uh, tool users and tool buyers, mm -hmm. as well as on uh, the, the tool suppliers themselves. So the solution is, providers. This is a hard problem to solve mm -hmm. because, I mean, what got you your success are right. these processes and ways of doing business. And, and now, then you're, to, now you're talking about taking them apart to take get them, even better. It's yes. a little risky. It's a little scary. Yes. Right? But then you end up in this situation where what you used to do 10 years ago doesn't leverage the great capabilities that are out there and is starting to not be relevant anymore. Right. Yeah. And that's not sustainable. And I don't know about other companies, but we're after our next hundred years. Yeah. Oh, well, and so are we. So, yeah. um, so um, this has been fascinating. I'm actually, when we get around to a, some podcasts on standards or maybe analytics that improve integration, I might title it that way. Because one of the things that's on my mind is data analytics might actually make this easier. Yes. The, the ability to plug things together that don't agree on an interface, right? But mm -hmm. some work needs to be done to, to actually make that happen. And that's we're, we're out of time for today. So, Tom, I'll hand it back to you. This has been a lot of fun. I, I hope I chat with you more, Gene. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to, Craig. Thanks. So, Gene, before we let you go, you started off in your introduction saying that you've been with Allison for 15 years and you've been in a variety of roles. So I think it's great to ask you because so many of our listeners are maybe earlier in their career and they're still trying to chart their path. What sort of, let's take this back to sort of the, the person who's listening to this podcast who maybe is trying to figure out their next maneuver, their next move. What career advice do you have for people in this world? Oh, sure. Uh, but boy, so much, right? Um, and I hope some of it's at least useful. But, <laughs> you know, I think one of the things that is the first thing to say is that it's hard work to build a career and you have to show up and you have to own it and you have to be willing to take the extra step and take a risk and recognize that you can make a mistake. I think that's an important thing for young engineers to know, but you've got to own that mistake if you make it, right? And, you know, if you're there showing up, working hard, doing the best you can with what information that you have, maybe taking some risks and continuing to drive, you know, those are really great foundations to build a career on. And there's a lot of work to be done these days and systems are really complex. And if you're going to dedicate yourself to your work and like I said, own it, be willing to take a little bit of risk and be out there um, leading that people are going to notice. And, and that helps because then you show that you've got some ability to step beyond your specific narrow objectives. And even if it's just taking on one other thing, take that risk and let the doors open for you. So in some of the work that I do with companies, I, I talk to teams about how do you get across the gap from potential to results in your career. But a lot of people sort of push back and they say, my company doesn't want me to take risks. And yet when I interview the executives, they do. And, mm -hmm. and bosses tell me they are looking for people. So when you give the advice, take some risks, do you think that bosses really want their employees to, I mean, obviously not like horrible giant risks, but <laughs> what I find is, is that employers and bosses and managers want their people to do this. And yet people think that's not what is wanted of them or expected of them. 
Yeah, and I guess what I would say is to the people from various companies that might be listening to this <laughs> would be to take a look around your company and find some people that have taken risks or made mistakes and ask yourself what the consequences were for those people. Because, you know, I think what they might observe is that nobody gets fired, right? That oftentimes those people are then the people who are being called on for the next thing because bosses, I mean, I'm one of them now, right? I want my engineers and my team to be out there pushing the envelope because if we're just going to do what we're doing, then that's not continual improvement. That's stagnation. Mm -hmm. And that's great because we may be able to sustain a great level of success, but come on, change is happening so fast these days. You've got to be taking risks and they don't have to be huge risks. They, it doesn't have to be. It has to be getting out there and stepping outside of your comfort zone. It has to be just doing the small things on an incremental basis every day. Those incremental risks are the things that are going to get you there. I mean, yeah, don't sign up for a tens of million dollar project and then don't plan it. That's not a risk. That's stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, Gene, you reminded me of one other risk. Sometimes you get asked to do jobs out of your comfort zone, brand new jobs. Yeah. Sounds like you've got a couple of those. I know every time I did that, it was only rewarding. It was stressful, but it was rewarding. So as you take those first risks and then you get a, maybe a job that's different than you expected or wasn't in your plan, keep an open mind and go after it. No, I completely agree with that. I think, you know, I guess a little bit of a story to tell here would be, you know, I was just a supervisor in electronic controls hardware when I was given the opportunity to go and lead the transmission uh, program for the TC10 as the lead engineer. And, you know, I hadn't designed a gear since college, right? And all of a sudden I'm dropped into this whole transmission architecture thing where <laughs> there, there's lots of, lots of cl clutches, all this mechanical stuff that, yeah, I'm a mechanical engineer, but I hadn't been doing hardcore mechanical engineering like that. And look, I got the, I had a great team. I had a great team of young engineers that was dedicated to the success of that product. And I was fortunate that I could, that I could work with them, but that was just a situation where Look, it was a great opportunity. You have to take it. And yes, it was uncomfortable. And yes, it was a lot of work. But the bottom line is, I mean, all the cool stuff you do, you don't know how to do it. You just have to try. Well, Gene, thank you so much for being a guest here on the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. Great. It was my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And hey, for everybody who listened, make sure that you tune in next week for more thoughts, ideas, and information in and around product lifecycle management. The Digital Enterprise Society is the place for the exchange of ideas around digital manufacturing tools. Check us out at digitalenterprisesociety.org. You've been listening to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. Learn more about what you've heard here today at digitalenterprisesociety.org. Join us again next week for more.